This is an event that actually mixes two very different worlds, even though often the underlying technologies might be the same. When you say big data, at least in my experience, often at MIT, mostly at MIT maybe, big data is a more technical approach. Surveillance comes with questions of politics. Hi, Emily of politics, of membership, of law, failures of law, abuse of power. If surveillance, however, does its job, they might, some of these governments might want, wind up with huge data sets, clearly, right? They, they will have big data. But I really want to emphasize that these are two different ways of constructing a subject that they at least partly share in terms of some of the technical issues. And in, in one sense, I would argue that big data is a variable. At this end, I have no objections. It could really be helpful. Like gathering all the data that you have about how the bikes are moving in New York City, what are the problems. At the other end, it can become very problematic. One image that I have is a kind of flattening of all kinds of very different realities into datums. So that is not necessarily so interesting. Surveillance today is clearly a massive problem that we face. There are no easy solutions. Uh, big data is sort of new because of the technology, though Napoleon was actually somebody who gathered quite a bit of data. He had big data sets about all kinds of things. Um, but surveillance today is different from surveillance in the past. Partly it is the technical issues. The technical issues, the potentialities involved in that technical aspect allow an extent you know, of surveillance that we have not seen before. There is no doubt about that. It allows that vis-a-vis -vis its own citizens, and it allows that vis-a-vis -vis other countries, including other, the famous case now, now famous of uh, the president of Brazil, having you know, some of her communications watched. So we are operating at a scale when we talk about surveillance today that is different from all the forms of surveillance, but I want to really emphasize that surveillance is a very old practice, but its technologies change. Now, uh, in 2010, I came across this map, and what I want to emphasize here is the extent to which something that is highly visible, highly material, might still somehow be invisible to us. So in 2010, I saw this map. Some of you may know it. This comes from the Washington Post. 16 researchers and journalists, some of their best journalists, worked on this. These are almost 10,000 buildings. Enormous materiality. Today, there are probably more, by the way. Huh? At this time, one of the biggest ones they were building was still the Utah that is now completed, I think, a big building in Utah. Now, these are full-time <laughs> surveillance for vis-a-vis -vis citizens, vis-a-vis -vis counterterrorism, et cetera, et cetera. When I showed these maps in lecture after lecture, nobody could quite, I, I don't know if nobody, but it seemed to me that people had a very hard time recognizing that this could be happening right here in the United States. And, and the amount that are in Washington, of course, is extreme. Uh, now, of course, after, you know, in the last two years, really thanks to The Guardian in many ways, who, and Snowden, uh, this has become a fact that we can all recognize is a reality. But the question for me then is, what is happening right now that we still cannot digest because it does not fit into these existing, uh, you know, the, the existing parameters that we have, parameters that we have for understanding this. Now, these buildings, an interesting datum about them, and I have to put my glasses on. So this is about 10,000 buildings. This is what we know. What we don't know huh, is what we don't know. We are discovering a lot in the last uh, two years, but still, there is still stuff probably that we don't know. Now, what we do know from these buildings is that 2,000 plus are government buildings. 
and almost 7,000 are firms. In other words, you have an extraordinary participation of all kinds of specialized firms in this business of gathering data. How the data gets used, you know, that can go in many different directions. Now, these are firms that are working with the government, for the government, whatever. There is an extraordinary amount of internationalism among the people. We're talking about over a million uh, uh, people with top secret clearance. If your best algorithm builder is a Malaysian physicist who is available, that person winds up in that system. So what you have at the top, and I find that sort of the most adorable feature of the whole thing, is a great internationalism. The logic of this system is that we who are being surveyed and data, actually most of the stuff is gathering data about us, right, just in case they might need it because some coincidences become visible when they analyze some of the data. So, you know, it's a certain kind of logic. But the logic of the system is that for that system to work, we are, in the first place, all suspect. So they gather the data. If you don't have that logic, why have this extraordinary superstructure? When I stand back, I ask myself two things. One is, who are the winners in this? The big tech companies certainly are doing well. If we all have to be subject to these data gathering mechanisms, if we all potentially are subject of surveillance, that's a lot of tech. All of that in order to catch a few potential terrorists or dangerous people. So it is a peculiar logic. The second question I ask myself, if this is indeed how the system works, one might ask oneself, who are we, the citizens, the immigrants who reside here, the visitors, who are we when we are subjected to that system? Are we sort of the new colonials of some sort? There are parallel worlds that cut across existing boundaries. And one of them is the apparatus for surveillance Germany works with the US and with the UK and with the Netherlands. Those are the four countries I'm studying right now. That is, by definition, a transnational system. And then there is us, still in many ways confined to a nation state for you know, most of our rights. So it's a very peculiar moment. Now, on the panel, we have Oh, I, I'm sorry, I had this slide here. Here are the numbers. I found this absolutely fantastic, just to make it very concrete. In Washington and the surrounding area, we have 33 building comp. Again, that is from 2010. By now, you know it's probably more. I don't know that for a fact. 33 building complexes for top secret intelligence work are under construction or have been built since September 2001. That really marks a new phase, as we all know. Together, they occupy about 17 million square feet the equivalent of almost three pentagons or 22 US Capitol buildings. I find that a kind of a formidable fact, let's say. Now, on the panel we have three very different types of, uh, of experts and, and also really people who inspire us. It's not just a question of narrow expertise, it's also a question of interpretation, the talent to interpret. Uh, Emily Bell, uh, whom I first heard about when she was still at The Guardian, I spent a lot of time in London, who really was, in a way, the magician behind making The Guardian the Commentist Free site we all know, or one of us know. When, when did that start, Commentist Free? Um, uh, 2006. 2006, and we all know that this was just an extraordinary success. Uh, it is, I think, at one point, I know it was the third most visited site, could that be, after BBC News site? Well, The Guardian was, is actually, I think, one of the most now, it's just behind the Daily Mail. Maybe. It's just behind but, the yeah. Daily Mail, there you go. <laughs> they run so, slightly more populist uh, it stories, <laughs> if, if you've ever seen the more Daily Mail. Side. Uh, <laughs> but it is really an extraordinary, uh, it's an extraordinary accomplishment. and. Um, uh, 
it's just great to have Emily here. So Emily is, is, a, is just a leading expert in how do you digitize a newspaper and a whole series of other things, and you will talk to us a bit. And that clearly is, is this is, again, this is, does not directly have to do with surveillance or with big data, but it is one of the <coughs> critical components in this technological space that we are developing. Um, Mark Hansen is professor of journalism, director of the David and Helen Gurley Brown Institute for Media Innovation, and chair of the New Media Center at the Institute for Data Sciences and Engineering at Columbia University. That is quite a long description, Mark. Previously, you were at UCLA in the Department of Statistics, the Department of Design, Media, Arts, and the <coughs> Department of Electrical Engineering. Hansen works with data in an essentially journalistic practice, crafting stories through algorithm, computation, and visualization. I, I think that is just fantastic. And the third speaker is Rebecca McKinnon, a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation, where she conducts research, writing, and advocacy on human rights, the internet, and corporate responsibility. <coughs> She's the author of a great book that I'm sure many of you have read, the author of Consent of the Network, the Worldwide Struggle for Internet <coughs> Freedom, and co-founder of Global Voices Online. That's a great organization. I, uh, I, uh, I follow it. And she serves on the boards of the Global Network Initiative and the Committee to Protect Journalists. She's a lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania and fluent in Mandarin Chinese. She was a CNN bureau chief and correspondent in Beijing and Tokyo. And uh, I guess that was part of really becoming fluent in Chinese. So I am now going <laughs> to leave the podium. To Emily. Thank you. Um, to, can I speak from here, oh, yes, or do I have to? I, I don't know whether I'm going to screw up the live stream. Um, th <laughs> thanks very much indeed, Saskia. Uh, and apologies, I've just got here from uh, actually a morning that I spent in Boston at the International Bar Association um, annual conference there, where we were talking about exactly the same things, which are surveillance uh, and data gathering and everything uh, in terms of how it relates to privacy uh, reporting and the law. It's amazing how much overlap uh, there is between um, lawyers and journalists sometimes, even though one likes yes. to think that there's great distance between them. It's not true. Um, but it, I mean, one thing I'd say right at, right at the top, and this is, you know, I, I'm still involved a little bit with The Guardian in that I sit on the Scott Trust, which is one of... Uh, which is the, the uh, ultimate kind of governing body, though we don't have any day-to-day -day, um, involvement with the journalism. Um, so I'm just making that declar declaration of interest now so that you, you, you know where I'm coming from on this. Um, one of the things that we, we all agreed, you know, both lawyers and journalists in the room this morning, was uh, what an incredible service uh, Edward Snowden and indeed um, The Guardian, The Washington Post, yeah. The Times have done. Uh, just in terms of peeling back uh, the uh, layers of um, obscurity and secrecy around how we're surveyed uh, as a society. Uh, and it has laid bare, I think, even the things that people intellectually thought that they knew but didn't really feel, uh, particularly the intersection of uh, government and commercial technological, if you, if you like, the big, the big platform companies uh, and the cell phone companies, and, and how those two uh, worlds, which are incredibly powerful, intersect, um, and how the individual is, uh, if you like, sort of disempowered. Um, when we think about this world of, sort of data and surveillance for journalists, and, and Mark will talk with much more um, precise expertise uh, than I will about, because he is, he is the person who can do. I can only talk about it, but he can actually do it. Um, to the, when I came to the J School three years ago, and we, were, we were thinking about what are, what are the things that we can make a, uh, ha, ha, what, what, what is digital journalism really, really about, you know, because, you know, or, or what is journalism about in the 21st century? Um, there are two things which are uh, in tension, um, but which we think a great deal about. One of which is, uh, how do we make the best use of data? 
uh, you know, de and, and, and data, uh, we're not just talking about necessarily the sets of um, uh, available uh, facts out there which are assembled for us by um, agencies, but we're also talking about the kind of trails uh, that we all throw off every day through, through these devices and through our social media uh, activities and through everything that we now publish. Uh, one of the things that we're doing at the J School this year is running a year-long uh, research project which we hope will turn into a uh, curriculum at the end of it um, and published reports. Uh, called the Sensor Newsroom Project, and that's Sensor with an S, not a C, because you know there, there's a huge question for us here, which is when, when you can increasingly survey everything, um, because let's be honest about this: that the things that Snowden was describing uh, with his uh, prism leaks uh, and uh, the, the the kind of if you like mass collection of data, is possible for government. Um, because of the falling cost of collection and examination, uh, it's, now, it's now worth it to have an enormous shiny building in Utah because at some point you will be able to examine um, and, and, and look for uh, a question that might occur to you in the future. Uh, in the past, that wasn't necessarily the case. The same is actually true for journalism. It's becoming much uh, cheaper for us to both collect and sift data in a way that it would have taken us weeks, months, years to, to get to complex stories before. Uh, so one of the things that we think about is, you know, what, what does this world of possibility open up to us as journalists? And then the second question, which uh, we've been asking kind of hypothetically and we haven't really been applying enough attention to, but we will be applying a lot more attention to it this year, is how do you protect your source mm -hmm. in the 21st century? You know, how, how, do you, how do you actually, and th these are the two, uh, if you like, competing rights right at the heart of this whole debate. Uh, how, how do you conduct source prote protection? Um, I think uh, tomorrow the CPJ is uh, releasing its report on yeah, protection. Thursday. Oh, is it Thursday? Yeah. Right. Okay. I forgot. Forget which day. I, forget which day on the tenth. Tenth. Yeah, that's right. I've got an embargoed copy. So there's, there's an embargoed copy over here, um, and we've seen. You know, let, let, there was an extract as well from uh, work that Len Downey's been doing on what has the effect been of, uh, if you like, the the, the, the tightening. Um, on uh, of uh, uh, people understanding that they're under surveillance within the journalistic community, and the answer is it's been really significant. You cannot have any exchange now between yourself and a source and assume that it is confidential, unless you're sitting in a secure room with them. Uh, this may not matter very much if you're the restaurant reviewer uh, of um, the New York Times, for instance to pick a job that we'd all like to do. Uh, but, but it might matter, it, it will matter a great deal if you're dealing with issues of um, dissent uh, and whistleblowing and power and holding power to account uh, in the most effective ways possible. It matters a, it matters a great deal. Uh, these are questions which are, if you like, old for the security uh, uh, agencies. They're old. Some of these issues are also old for computer scientists and, 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 and uh, statisticians and specialists like Mark. They're very new for journalism. You know, mm -hmm. they, these are actually relatively new questions in terms of techniques How new? and technology. You relatively new? Well, you know, there's always been an issue about how do you protect a source. There's always, a, but, yeah. but if you think about, I, I remember um, three years ago when I, when I arrived here, it was just uh, I sort of almost simultaneously with uh, WikiLeaks starting to release their, they, they had the Afghan war logs, collateral damage, and, the, and then the big cache of documents f fell in the autumn. Um, and uh, I remember both reading and, and talking to Alan Rusbridge, the editor of the, the Guardian at the time, and reading accounts of actually doing the journalism around that, and talking to other people uh, in newsrooms who were trying to extract, if you like, sense from these vast sort of troves of data. Right. Right. Uh, and, you know, it was saying, well, well, it, it, it was impossible to scale, you know, human effort, endeavour, mm -hmm. so, so they had to really sort of start to adopt techniques uh, and, and, and data mining techniques that, that were really very new for newsrooms. I'd say not, not generally new, but very new for new, newsrooms. The difficulty with all of this is it's <laughs> happening at a time when 
resources are low in newsrooms, uh, the ability to hire data scientists and data specialists is, uh, and security specialists as well, um, is, is relatively limited in a financial sense. But it's also a time when actually these skills couldn't be more uh, significant, I think, for newsrooms, um, as, a, along with this, uh, this journalistic sense of how do we contextualise this and where do we draw the line? Because you know we're also reporting on people. It's all very well to talk from the point of view of the New York Times or the Guardian or <laughs> CNN or whatever, but you know we're also talking about reporting which can be enormously invasive into people's lives. A, a type of a broad publication, um, which uh, is now not only, um, if you like, uh, completely transformed in terms of how many people do it you know this is not something where we're talking about the journalistic profession as a set of people who are employed by news organizations i'm talking about anybody who publishes uh information um in 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 a, in a journalistic sense uh so we have a whole new set of um standards and uh, a whole new set of really kind of i, I suppose we have new, new new we have critical thinking to be done in journalism which uh, I think we're, we're not, we, we haven't really been focusing hard enough on. And this extends from everything about the rights of the individual and, and what, what publishing does to, to a piece of information, because publishing is an act which changes the nature of the information. Um, and w what do we do in terms of actually making sure that there is proper uh, discourse and a, a, a real, um, if you like, open and secure line to to talk to people who can throw greater light on this. Uh, we, a lot of our, I'll, I'll just I'll stop now, but a lot of our information, let's not forget, in every university, in every newsroom, is held by organisations who may have the very best intentions, uh, and I mean the Googles and the Facebooks and the, the, the Twitters of this world, and Rebecca, I know, sort of is, is the expert here, but they're not intrinsically, what I would call, they're not intrinsically journalistic, they're not intrinsically academic. At their heart, they have a commercial purpose, uh, and they can't provide, or, or, or they don't have as, a, as an overwhelming motive, the protection of sources and the dissemination of difficult stories that, that hold people to account. Thank you very, very much. Mark? Oh. oh. Sorry, I had slides. You have slides. <laughs> you're, a, you're a pictures sorry, person. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, can we full screen this? Or? I always like that part. Also, yeah. that's what you need to do. Work. <laughs> the process. Are we obstructing a lot or a little? Very little, they're black backgrounds. You could stand up and not really obstruct at all. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. I am inevitably, when I'm feeling out of my element, I resort to somebody else's words. So uh, I joined uh, uh, Columbia a year and four months ago. Um, Saskia says, yes, that's right, uh, as if she had asked me with a quiz. Um, uh, and uh, I, I was previously at, um, well, my background is in statistics. My doctorate's in statistics. I was at Bell Labs for 10 years in the data mining research group, um, and then taught statistics for 10 years at UCLA. Um, and I come from a place where, or I come from maybe a set of traditions where we understand, um, or a, a lot of our, our, the conservatism in the statistics field is around knowing the limitations of, of, of data and describing, completely describing um, sort of the world as, as we see it. Um, I think this quote is a, is a beautiful one. Uh, it's from Joseph Wiesenbaum, uh, who was the author of the ELISA program, which is one of the first uh, examples of artificial intelligence. Um, and the quote is simply, sometimes when my children were still little, my wife and I would stand over them as they lay sleeping in their beds. We spoke to each other only in silence, rehearsing a scene as old as mankind itself. It is, it is, as Ionesco told his journal, not everything is unsayable in words, only the living truth. So I come from a tradition where that understands the gap between data and lived experience, um, but then found myself very quickly in a place um, where 
where the word was everything, where, as Pulitzer puts it, the, world, the word is powerful and can take, um, can take, uh, uh, take down institutions, can, can shape policy. Um, uh, I, I bring this up uh, simply because, um, well, a lot of my work is also um, uh, uh, around, as, as Saskia mentioned, around storytelling. The pieces um, have had the, the benefit of, of uh, working for the last uh, 15 years or so with um, artists on collaborations that draw on data and use data in a creative way. Everything from embedding data visualizations in the lobby of the New York Times building, a piece we worked on, um, to the new, uh, the new sort of data chandelier in the lobby of the, uh, of the public theater. Um, so a lot of my work is around, around um, uh, 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 creative encounters with large, complicated data sets. And that's the background I bring um, to the J School. Um, interestingly, the flattening that Saskia referred to, I felt firsthand. Um, a lot of these works, for example, are, are works of data visualization. And over the last 10 to 15 years, what you've seen is a kind of, a kind of um, opening of that practice, so that the flattening through shared tools, um, through, uh, uh, um, um, uh, through sort of open data sources, um, has, 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 has created a kind of flat terrain across which artists, designers, statisticians, scientists, what have you, can all meet and talk about these sort of visual objects. So there's, a, there's in turn, then, multiple critiques that can be brought to bear on a work of data visualization, let's say. Is it a piece of art? Is it, um, is it meant to be science? Is it meant to be information? How do you interpret it? And that kind of flattening is happening similarly in, in, in sort of more data and data technologies broadly. So, uh, and, and I've done straight up data visual, we'll come back to this. So my role at the, the journalism school um, is to maybe fulfill some of what Emily had talked about in terms of what journalists need. Um, undoubtedly, data and data technologies are changing systems of power in our society, and journalists, as Emily refers to them as the explainers of last resort, have to be able to think critically about new moves in data, new moves in technology. Um, and that means um, not just sort of having paying lip service to it, but really understanding the stuff of it. Um, uh, in, in trying to describe this to my students, um, you can think about, about journalists as, as, um, as locating their practice anywhere along a kind of pipeline from the first bits that emerge in the, from some phenomena in the world to an analysis or to a story. Mm -hmm. So where do you put, where do you put, uh, you, you, can, you can put your, your practice anywhere along those lines and we need journalists all along that line to help tell us, you know, from how we turn the world into data to how, the, how we're telling stories from that data. Um, uh, uh, are, are places that I think journalists need to play um, a much bigger role. So I tell my students in these next few slides are from my class, um, so they might be a little overly cheery when it comes to big data because I need to entice what are oftentimes humanity students into a world of code and algorithm and programming. <laughs> no offense intended. Um, so big data, uh, just to put a point on the map, um, Ed Dumbill uh, refers to big data as three things, uh, uh, volume, uh, data, uh, what characterizes or what makes data big is its volume, its velocity, that is the rate at which it's constantly changing, constantly encouraging, and its variety. Everything is being uh, sort of slowly trans translated into um, objects that can be uh, treated as data. So you s the rise of the digital humanities is a great example. Artifacts of the humanities, text, Images are being translated into, into data and then subject to the the, the, um, uh, the the kinds of processing that that happen. Interestingly, um, well, so so what I tell my hand in hand with the rise of big data, you find the rise of data science, which as a statistician is a slightly troubling term because we always thought we were the data scientists, but <laughs> surprise, we're not. Um, and when I sell my students on what data science means, I usually appeal to DJ Patil who define a data scientist as someone who has 
technical expertise, some natural curiosity, abilities in storytelling that is pulling stories from data, and an, inha an innate cleverness, the ability to look at data in various and creative ways. And as I tell my students, that's what journalists are, right? If you, if you tack on the, the technical expertise. So part of my role in the J School is to train students to be able to think critically through data and data technologies, to work with data and data technologies in new ways, to tell new kinds of stories, um, to interrogate those systems of power that are changing because of, because of their presence. As Emily mentioned, projects like the Sensor Newsroom, um, having, having journalists understand and participate in the same effect that's making big science happen, the fact that sensors are getting cheaper, the fact that storage is getting cheaper, the fact that, that, um, that uh, 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 you know, computer power is more and more um, available, um, that, that, that they, can, they can cash in on that, they can be part of that system, and that by being part of that system and by designing things, that they, um, that they're learning by doing, they're interrogating, they're, 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 um, uh, uh, um, they're, they're being part of that, um, that part of that process. So, so that's, I guess, a little bit about what I might bring to this conversation: the idea of, of data as, as a critical component of storytelling, and the idea, in particular, that plus or minus a little bit of technical expertise that I promise you we can deliver on, journalists. Humanities majors are 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 um, are uh, uh, important um, uh, pieces of, of the data science of, of let's say a data or a data science um, uh, story. I, I should mention too that Saskia said I, I'm um, chair of the uh, committee of uh, for new media uh, of the Institute for Data Sciences and Engineering here, and part of what we're doing in that committee is bringing in parts of campus that you don't necessarily think of when you think of data. So uh, our, 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 um, our uh, uh, committee includes people from, from education, from architecture, from uh, history, from English. Um, and part of the reason why I would like to see journalists or humanities majors or have you sort of building up that technical expertise part is that if we can get journalists across the line from tool user to tool maker, the tools that they create will be inflected with the values and the ethics of their discipline um, uh, uh, and, and, and sort of change the conversation, right? That, that, that each discipline has with it some core values. And so when a journalist makes technology, when a human, someone in the humanities makes a piece of or thinks through um, how to analyze data or make data, they are going to do that in a way that is, again, inflected with their values and ethics that, that will um, will be very different than when um, these tools are created solely by computer scientists and engineers and statisticians. Not that there's anything wrong with us, but that we have a very different set of reference points, right? And so the more people we can bring into this, I think, I think the better. And that's the technical expertise piece at the top. I'll stop there and... Um, that is great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'm going to sit in solidarity with Emily, so we have two yes. standing, two sitting. Um, ch ch change gears. How many of you were alive in 1969 and politically conscious enough to remember Country Joe and the Fish uh, and the song they sang at Woodstock? Raise your hand. Okay. So, uh, if, a friend of mine, Simon Davies, who's founder of Privacy International um, in London, recently rewrote the lyrics to the famous Country Joe and the Fish song. The chorus for that song was one, I'm not gonna try to inflict my singing on you, but one, two, three, who are we fighting for? What are we fighting for? Excuse me, one, two, three, what are we fighting for? So he changed the lyrics you know, entirely, um, you know, uh, but the chorus is one, two, three, what are we spying for? And that is, I think, the question for our generation, and it's a question that not only uh, Americans, uh, our American citizens are asking, but people around the world, that the, the battle against unaccountable, pervasive, opaque surveillance is a global fight, uh, and it's, in my experience, joining together people from absolutely all over the world. Um, and, and so that's, that's just one comment I wanted to open with as we change gears rather abruptly. Um, 
secondly, I, I, I guess I, I wanted to um, go out on a limb and assume that most people in the room have not read my book, so that if I repeat a story from that book, how many people in the room? Okay, not very many, good. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going out on too much of a limb here. So, uh, so to, to underscore Saskia's point that, you know, surveillance didn't start with the internet, and, right. and, and, and certainly, you know, in my teaching experience, I, a, a lot of students seem to assume that. Um, and uh, uh, how many of you have read uh, Timothy Garton Ash's book, The File? Mm. A, few, a, a few people. So I, I want to repeat a, a story uh, that, that maybe a few people have heard, but I think most people haven't, about when I was working as a journalist in China. And I got to China in the early 90s, before the internet arrived in China, before all but kind of the most professional people um, had any kind of cell phone. Um, and surveillance was pretty heavy, especially if you were a foreign correspondent. There were guys who would sometimes follow you around in cars or in dark suits and duck behind bushes when you looked behind you. Uh, and, uh, you know, people were, journalists were often finding microphones in various interesting places in their homes and offices. Uh, and, and it was kind of assumed that if you wanted to have a private conversation, uh, you should do so, you should take a walk. Um, and, and so, so it's kind of interesting that we sort of, as journalists in that type of environment, developed habits very early on in terms of um, protecting sources. But uh, then as cell phones and the internet came along, um, very interestingly, even by the, the late 90s, the habit was firmly ingrained. If you were meeting somebody uh, who you figured the government didn't want you to meet, everybody leaves their cell phones back at home or in the office and goes somewhere and takes a walk with no devices. Because of course these devices are, you know, they, they can be activated and used, used as a reverse listening to device even if they're turned off as long as the battery's in them. And, and that was something we kind of learned very early uh, and which I think most American journalists still don't know. But, but th there's a lot of that kind of thing. And that if we really wanted to have a confidential conversation, uh, it could not be digital. Um, and, you had and to go that to the park in, or in a swimming pool? <laughs> sorry? <laughs> to the park or the swimming pool? Or, you know, go for a hike. For um, a hike, right. Yeah. Um, but but the, that, that kind of was, was a habit that, that uh, was ingrained very early, you know, in that type of environment. Um, but coming back to Timothy Garton Ash, I, I happened to read his book um, when I was living and working in China. And uh, I uh, went out to dinner one night with some Chinese friends and recounted the book to them. Now, this book is about, uh, Timothy Garton Ash is a British historian and he focused on Eastern Europe, uh, still does to a large extent. Um, and his book was about how uh, he had done research in Berlin, in East Berlin, before the wall came down. And then he went back soon after the wall came down, was able to get his own file and was able to talk to other uh, East Germans who, because after the wall came down, the Stasi, the German secret police, was opened up and people could go and see the records that the Stasi had on them. And it became a highly controversial thing because people were finding out of a spouse or a lover or a neighbor or a relative or their children or their, you know, it, it was very traumatic what, what people were discovering about who'd been informing on them. And a lot of people actually decided that they didn't want to see their file, they just wanted to move on. So I, I described this book to my Chinese friends over a, a, a dinner of uh, hot Sichuan food and a lot of beer. Uh, and uh, when, uh, when I finished, uh, one of my Chinese friends have looked around the table and, and said, one day this will happen in China and then I'll know who my real friends are. The table went completely silent. <laughs> the thing is though, that if that time were to happen and people were to be able to look at their dossiers. Their dossiers would be in facilities kind of like that NSA thing in Utah, you know, and it's not friends and neighbors and people spying on you anymore. It's all of our devices. And it's not just in China. You know, that, that data is being logged all over the world, everywhere, through corporate intermediaries that we're depending on. Um, and so we can get into a lot more details in the discussion, but um, a lot of my work over the past several years has been focusing on the fact that 
Um, our civic lives, all aspects of our lives, but our civic lives, our political lives, uh, are increasingly mediated through private companies that um, provide the electronic platforms and services and devices that we need to communicate, to understand the world, to organize, to do whatever, to conduct our journalism. And so if we do not hold these companies to not just civil liberty standards, but global human rights standards, if, if we do not have a way to hold these companies accountable, if these companies do not make commitments to respect basic human rights standards of their users and customers, I argue in my book, and I continue to argue, the future of democracy, the future of our ability to use the internet to advocate for human rights, you just forget about it. I mean, it's, it's going to be drastically corroded. Our ability, the, the, the future of the internet to be something on which investigative journalism is even possible um, is, is not something you can assume. Um, and in fact, the trend lines are, are going in the wrong direction. And I argue that there are things we can do, but we have to actually make an effort to ensure that the internet evolves in a manner um, that is compatible with the kind of society we want to have. And that's not only about holding our government accountable, which we've done a crappy job of doing, um, but holding companies accountable in terms of how they're collecting data, how they're using it, and how they're sharing it with various entities, including the government. Um, and we need to ensure that power as exercised across digital networks and power over our information is exercised in an accountable way. When that power is abused, we need to be able to know that that abuse happened and we need to have some way to visit consequences on those who abuse that power. And unless we find a way to do that, our own democracy you know, is in the balance. And I would say the, you know, the ability of others in other parts of the world to use the internet uh, to improve their um, political um, situations, to conduct investigative journalism, to advocate for their rights is, is uh, jeopardized. Um, I'm working on a project, which I can talk about more later, uh, where I'm trying to develop a methodology to rank companies on free expression and privacy criteria. I've also been involved for a number of years in something called the Global Network Initiative, which has basically taken international human rights standards, not, not First Amendment and Fourth Amendment, but Article 19, Article 17 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, guaranteeing the human, not US person, human right, yes. right to <laughs> privacy and free expression, uh, and articulating uh, the obligations of companies um, if, if they are to be consider considered to be acting in a manner that respects international human rights norms. Um, and I don't have too much more time, but um, just speaking of international human rights norms, um, there's starting to be some very, I think, important analysis being done uh, about uh, the NSA surveillance program uh, and, and what we've learned uh, from the Snowden revelations. And uh, a young scholar, legal scholar named Alex Sinha, who's currently working with the ACLU and Human Rights Watch, has just come out with a really, I think, important paper uh, in which he articulates the ways in which the NSA surveillance program is violating international, the, the United States international human rights commitments to the International Government Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And that is troubling from two perspectives. It's troubling just from the moral sense that our country has made international human rights commitments. Uh, it's, try it's telling lots of other people around the world that they ought to live up to human rights and the fact that um, we are not actually uh, walking our talk is, is troubling from a moral point of view. But f even if you don't care about the moral point of view, from the practical point of view, if you care about the economic value of the internet, if you, if you care about just the internet functioning like the internet at all, um, it's troubling. And the reason is that um, you're starting to see a lot of calls from a lot of governments, not just authoritarian governments, but Brazilian government, a number of European governments, 
uh, for something called data sovereignty, which is basically they're saying, well, you know, we, we totally can't control what Google's going to give to the NSA, and Google doesn't seem to be able, they claim they can't control it either, so therefore we're going to require that, you know, if, if a company, a cloud computing company uh, is, is serving our citizens, they have to have their servers in our jurisdiction so that we can regulate it and control it. So what's the problem with that? Well, if you take that to an extreme, data sovereignty is actually already being practiced. It's being practiced uh, to the most fullest extent. Where? Does anybody want to venture a guess? China. Uh, well, North Korea, is, they're, they're, they're an intranet. They're not even intranet, but, but China. So, so for instance, Microsoft went into, uh, took its cloud computing service into, um, into China recently. And the Chinese government requires that if you're going to um, provide the service to Chinese citizens, you, you, know, you will be blocked unless you actually do, do it with a Chinese company, in partnership with a Chinese company, and put your data in China. And so they, they did kind of work out a, a thing so that actually even users in China can choose to use their international service if they kind of notice that that's an option, that that is an option. But, but this, this is part of the requirement. And so then what happens is, is that you have services that are increasingly balkanized within different jurisdictions Governments can block stuff they don't like much more easily. Uh, they can surveil things and stop things at the border much more easily. Um, and it also plays into uh, a battle over uh, internet governance that has been going on. Internet standards, routing protocols, and so on, for the most part right now, are determined not by governments, but by several multi-stakeholder organizations that involve engineers, companies, governments are involved too, but there's sort of a negotiation of different interests because the way the internet currently works, it's globally interconnected. It's not kind of nation state, nation state, nation state, right? Um, there's a, a group of countries that have been arguing for several years that internet governance should be moved under the auspices of the United Nations, that it should be one nation, one vote for how the U.S. gets, you know, how standards are set and how internet, uh, how the internet routing is protocol is is coordinated, uh, and that all this multi-stakeholder stuff is, you know, anti-sovereignty and that's bad. And this NSA business is playing right into that, and. Um, that's troubling because basically what a number of governments and telecommunications companies within the ITU are calling for is that the internet should be structured much more like the international telephone system. So that there, there's actually a number of pro proposals at the ITU so that, let's say you're in Kenya, if you want to access websites that are hosted on servers in Kenya, it's cheap. But if, you, if you're in Kenya and you want to access Global Voices, which is hosted you know, in the Netherlands, you have, you have to pay the equivalent of international dialing fee. You know, so, so basically there's this feeling that there's not sufficient opportunities for rent seeking going on with the internet and, and people who had been making money off of rent seeking off the phone system have lost all their money and so there's a way to kind of reestablish that. And so this, this uh, basically kind of blatant disregard for the rights of international internet users on the part of the United States kind of plays into a whole set of very cynical um, efforts that are going on around the world by various players who either want to control the internet for power reasons or want to control it for commercial and basically rent-seeking reasons because they've lost their monopoly. Uh, and, and so if for no other reason than, than these reasons, it is imperative if the United States you know, wants U.S. companies to succeed and remain competitive globally and remain viable globally, um, and I'll stop in a moment, um, and if U.S. companies want to be viable globally, it's essential that U.S. companies step up and make a commitment to respect the internationally recognized rights of global internet users and that the U.S. government and governments of democracies around the world also make a commitment to that surveillance cannot be blanket and unaccountable and that having checks and balances 
and having some rules about necessary and proportionate matter. And they matter even if you don't care about the moral, even if you don't care about human rights, there's some commercial arguments to be made for if you want the internet to have any value at all. Very useful that's it. Commercial arguments, yes. Thank you very much. Right. Now, um, I, I am. I'm. I think we should move to questions. I hope we have two, uh, two microphones. And while that gets organized, you think, etc. You can ask general questions, particular questions. I just want to make a couple of comments. And one of them is just picking up on what Rebecca was saying at the end, that this balkanizing uh, may work very well for powerful actors, but it really does not work well for those who lack access to formal instruments for making. And so, for instance, I've been involved with anti-trafficking networks. We would go down, you know, a lot of the work that is being done, we just, it just would, if we had this balkanizing, if it becomes like the international telephone companies, basically, or the international telephony system. And, um, and so I wanted to just to ask three, three questions. One, uh, let me start with Rebecca, since she just uh, finished speaking, but don't answer yet. It's just three questions. So to Rebecca, my question to you is, I completely agree with your analysis, you know, that it really matters to protect this. And, the issue, the problem is not just states, but also firms. Not all firms, I mean, m most firms are little firms, but the big firms, we don't need to name them here. Um, how, from your perspective, the work that you have been doing, and, and I think we share certain concerns and certain critical positions, how do we manage this? How, I mean, you know, I, I always ask myself, how do we govern extremely powerful actors? states, multinational corporations, financial firms. I stand back and I look at the arc of their you know, rising to power and then collapsing and I say, really, they usually abuse their own power enough to make a bit of a shambles you know, close to the ground so other actors can move in. I, for instance, I have great trouble imagining that finance, high finance as we know it today, can actually be governed by an outsider. The best we can do is keep it out of certain domains. So in, in the stuff that you are looking at, you know, what do you have instruments, I think maybe making new law, et cetera, but you know what, what? Now, Emily, I love this notion that how you repositioned the journalist, you know, in your comments. And then the, the, the image that you produced in my mind at least was sort of the journalism school as partly workshopping, as they say, you know, journalism, so that reinventing. Now, the Columbia University School of Journalism is, of course, a very distinguished school with some resources. How does this new landscape that you mentioned actually function in poor countries, where you may have very good journalists? Like I know quite a few Latin American countries that are poor. There are not these resources, but they have great journalists, you know, really. the, the, the And, and um, Mark, the flattened space. Now, when I said it, I meant it sort of negatively. You know, I was imagining we take a city and we flatten it into big data bits, you know, and then some, believe me, some consulting company can come up with some great stuff to sell, you know, to willing buyers for a lot of money. You made it into a very promising space because you said here and here at, again, at Columbia, you know, you have people from many different disciplines coming together you know, around it all, and some, some possibility of making, I don't know, a third space or something that is different. Do you see limitations in this? I mean, sometimes when I have tried to do interdisciplinary work, I always, you know, my risk, my, my, my discomfort is always that we go down to the simplest common denominator, and that doesn't advance matters. We at the Committee on Global Thought, you know, who are sponsoring this, we have that, that is a battle always, you know, how do we mix disciplines? How do we keep uh, ourselves at, at the least common denominator and build that bridge that makes us communicate? So in your beautiful flattened space where the dancers and the statisticians can somehow connect, you know, how do you see it? Rebecca, you want to start, or shall we let Mark start? Mark, maybe you start since I just... <coughs> Um, so I, Did I put you on the spot? No, no. Okay. Um, 
I, and I did I do take it as a as a as that the, at least I use the term flattening in a positive sense in yeah. the sense that that the that the the, the the possibility of like the sharing of and here I mean the sharing of code the sharing of technology the sharing of of um, of, of um, sort of frameworks for looking at data that 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 is going to 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 ease um, I would say some of the or, or opens a possibility for the creation of new kinds of technologies and new ways of thinking about things that wouldn't have happened before. Right. Right? When, when technology is solely the tool of computer scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, of scientists in general, right? we have one set of practices that emerge, one set of things that happen. Um, when you start to uh, bring in values from other disciplines, things change. For example, um, in computational science now, there's a push toward reproducibility, right? So for many, many years, if you were to pick up a journal paper in the computational sciences, chances are you would not be able to reproduce the results that were in there, even mm -hmm. if it was a piece of computation, because they weren't described mm -hmm. clearly enough mm -hmm. um, to be able to do that. Now, when journalists take up computation, when journalists take up um, uh, analysis of data, transparency, reproducibility, those are first order principles. Right, so had the journalists taken up those technologies early, tools for reproducibility, tools for that sort of thing might have come along much earlier. Right, um, you see similar sorts of things happening, again, with the, with the digital humanities where new types of questions, new sorts of concerns. I can't tell you how many digital humanities panels I've been on now where you know, <laughs> the question is, you know, the standard statistical graph has time, chronological time on the x-axis and something on the y. And the first question is, I don't like chronological time. I want to think about some other notion of time, right? And those questions don't come up when you don't have other disciplines at the table asking about it. So I, I think, I think, you know, the, uh, so facetiously, it's not a, a dance, a space of dance or whatever. It, it's, it's, it, it, it's a, it's the fact that tools can be shared. It's a workspace, actually. It's, it's a workspace. And I, and, I, and, and and I think that the, the, the way we keep, we keep it from living at the level of the lowest common denominator is to make the lowest common denominator not something, um, not something um, from a technological perspective anyway, not something we're embarrassed by. And part of that w will happen uh, when hopefully K through 12 steps up and starts teaching technology in a more sophisticated way, starts talking about technology in a critical way, starts unpacking technology as fundamentally the product of human activity, of human creativity, of human yeah. intervention, that there is no data, Techni. that right. there is no data without human memory um, mm -hmm. intervention mm -hmm. uh, and some exercise of some control. So, so there's, there's, there is fundamentally a question of, of, of raising that lowest common denominator when it comes to discussions of technology. Um, and, that, and that when you have this kind of flattened terrain of code and data, that you actually have, the po you have, you have objects to organize around and interact around that you don't have ordinarily. So I, I, I do take that as a, as a as I a almost have tears in my eyes. Actually, it sounds beautiful. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, really, it, it, that sounds very good. I love also studying when, when you're very, very young, like K-12, whatever that is, or K-1. I don't know what that is exactly, but you must be very young, right? Me? When you're K-1, no, <laughs> not you. <laughs> starting in school very early. But no, I think that, that is just great. I must say, I really, I really appreciate that. Emily, you want to? Um, yeah, I, I, I was and just thinking actually, good. which is unusual for me and indeed for a journalist, that I was probably wrong um, earlier on when I said uh, that resource in newsrooms was making it hard for them to adopt new skills. I think it's actually making it imperative for them to adopt the new skills. It's just that there aren't very many of them kind of available uh, in, in newsrooms. So to your question about um, how is this possible in less well-resourced and more... Yeah. Um, uh, restricted parts of the world. Pro pro you know, Rebecca is, is better equipped to answer that than I am. Mm. But you know, I mean, two things. It plays into exactly what Rebecca was talking about, uh, which is um, you know, it doesn't actually cost very much to uh, do acts of journalism now. Um, it costs nothing, in fact. Yeah. You know, the, the, what they call the unit of um, value creation uh, in journalism is less than one person. It can mm. be five minutes of your time. It can be just something you put on the internet. But for it to be effective, you have to have you know, a, an interconnected and uh, 
sort of publishing platform right. that, that right. other people can access pretty yeah. freely, which is why. And, and again, so when we when we talk about this is about sort of data and surveillance and you know how all of these kind of various um, strata of what uh, you, you know we're looking at affect the field of the fields that we're in. Um, this is actually why it's really important that uh, the press starts to pay attention to technology as a human rights story as opposed to mm -hmm. gadget story, yeah. um, mm -hmm. to pay attention to things that go beyond uh, you know, IPOs and quarterly earnings for technology companies. Uh, who, you know, who has mapped yet where um, influence and thought around uh, privacy issues uh, and um, other kind of you know sort of technical considerations that have an impact on tech have been uh, bought or squared off by the major players in this space. I would love to see a piece of journalism that says, mm -hmm. "Here is everybody who, in one way or another, has been paid to uh, sit it in the Google tent, in the Facebook tent, you know, whatever for ha ha for however long." Uh, because I think you'll find that there's a, a again kind of you know we're not just talking about governments here; we're talking about you know we're just talking about commercial interests as well. Uh, so, so, so just to, it's actually it's easy to do um, it's easy to do good journalism and have it seen by a lot of people. Um, it's much easier than it has been in the past, uh, but uh, only if the systems are robust and oriented towards doing that. And I think that what we're now all feeling quite squeamish about is that it's clear that you know those systems are not very good for. Communication that, that keeps you out of you know just and, and we see it we've seen a reaction in every part of the world including this one to the ease with which information travels the reaction to it is yeah. a set of much harder physical barriers in in law and in restraint and you know whether it's the New York Police Department uh, stopping and frisking whether it's them telling journalists that they have to stand over there um, instead of over there. Uh, 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 whether it's stopping uh, Dave Miranda at um, yes. customs in yeah. London, uh, whether it is uh, you know pr pr producing, if you like, ever more difficult uh, barriers for you to kind of do your work or, 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 or physically move around. Um, you know, we, we we have seen that reaction. We talk about you know Obama's use of the Espionage Act and the war on leakers. It you know it, it, it's becoming much easier now just because you can detect. Uh, who is in possession of this information, and that's tr that will that's true of every that's true of every country in the world as well. You know, so so your detection is you know the ease of doing journalism is greater, but the detection right. uh, by the authorities is 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 easier as well. Uh, and we have to have a kind of an international, you know, we have to have an international journalistic response to this, which is a bit mm -hmm. more kind of joined up. But I think an added issue is that we have these strange zones that are like the equivalent of the yeah. high seas jurisdiction, yeah. where all law, all state yeah. law ceases to yeah. operate. Yeah. And we have that these technologies produce the equivalent yeah. of that, you know, that it's yes. not clear what is a violation yeah. of the law and what is... Uh, and, and when are you in compliance with the law? Yes, and, and, and this issue of the public sphere, you know, what, what is really public yeah, versus exactly. what's commercial yes. that tolerates yes. kind of a, an amount of public interaction. These are really nerdy subjects that, yeah. you know, that, that, that are not being properly or haven't been until now properly aired and given. You know, pe people aren't informed. I don't think people can can feel properly informed about this or properly engaged yeah. with it. In America, it's actually much better. In Europe, um, Germany's been very focused on the NSA stories, a couple of other places. Um, the UK, not so much. Uh, mm. You know, it's a, it's a very interesting kind of, again, just how, how can, you know, if people don't have the full facts, they can't really sort of be yeah. well armed about, Thanks, you know, Rebecca, can we hold off on your sure. comment because I see these people have been waiting here and uh, maybe one of the questions will have you the opportunity. So you, do you have a question? Oh, me? Yes. Well, I do actually. I wasn't in line, but I do. If that's all right. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. So as a journalist, I'm curious and I'm very passionate about all these subjects and I want to know, um, this is a little bit targeted at Mark, but to the others as well what I can practically do starting tomorrow um, in order to help, like for example, become not just a tool user or a tool, yeah, tool user, but a tool maker. Is that just learning Java? What, else, what other skills are necessary um, given and through this lens of data surveillance 
in order to be successful and especially useful in a um, setting today, journalism setting. Let's see, shall we, could, you, you want to answer, Mark, uh, or? Sure, um, I would say uh, this evening, maybe not tomorrow, you could um, start with, um, I, th I think, so, so since joining the, the journalism school, um, I've been asked a lot what a toolkit should be or what a tool set should be or what skills do we have to provide and I'm, I'm becoming increasingly scratchy about that question because there are a set of tools today that would be useful, a set of things that were like I'm, I'm teaching my students but really what you're teaching when you're teaching them these things is, is a process, mm -hmm. is how to acquire new technology, how to understand what's going on, how to, how to decide oh that's something important that I should pay attention to and that's not. This is a development that I need to learn more about and that's not and that we're, you're learning the skill so by learning a programming language um, I, I would recommend Python by the way at the moment um, uh, um, <laughs> By learning a programming language, you're learning some of the basics about 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 how a computer operates, about how um, computers interoperate, about communication protocols. I mean, there's a, a lot of pieces that start to unpack that then make some of the the the, the reporting around the Snowden case or what have you less mysterious, less like you start to see sort of how things start to function, right? And so, so I think the, the, you know, I can give you a list of things to maybe start with today, but to, to then keep in mind that what you're doing by learning them is not learning the tool per se, but learning how one thinks with technology, because to take that on as part of your practice, you're taking on a fundamentally unstable partner that's always changing, that's always moving, and you want to, to know what the, char the characteristics of that are and how you can sort of track what comes next. Because as I tell my students, if, if you're using the same tools two years from now that I'm teaching you today, then you're not doing it right. Rebecca, you wanted to add something? Yeah, just a, an observation, having been involved with a lot of citizen media kind of platforms and experiments and, and so on, um, and a number of journalistic efforts. Um, I think sometimes, you know, the tool makers, maybe as the news organization as a whole, rather than every single journalist in the organization, uh, because frankly, if you're going to be a software developer, you will not have time to go out and also get to, you know, get a story. Um, I mean, it depends on what you're doing, but, um, I, I I think it's it's knowing the tech, understanding the technology enough to understand kind of where things are going, sort of what what the latest developments are, so that you can work with, you know, that that you can work together with software developers. Um, you know, that there is going to be some division of labor, and there 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 are some types of journalistic activities and jobs where being able to code yourself is is really important, but I think for a lot of other journalists uh, or editors or others, it's just knowing how to talk the language of the technology and not being afraid of it and working with it um, and kind of being a power user in, in a way that, that you're sort of talking to the developers about how, what the needs are, what the values are, and kind of working collaboratively together necessarily than being the developer yourself. It, it sort of, again, it depends on what the tool is, what the project is, uh, and, and so on. But, but um, okay. I, that's been my experience <laughs> as well. Your question? Okay. Uh, I'm a journalist, I work for CCTV of China, and uh, we are shooting a documentary called The Internet Age. So I have a question for Emily. So I know that you are the key person to help the Guardian to go digital. Uh, so I want to know uh, how and why uh, did you make, make that transformation from newspaper to, to the digital content? And uh, uh, a lot of people say the uh, internet is uh, destroying the traditional media. And uh, do, you, do you agree with that? And how the traditional media can survive in the internet age? Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm really not the key person. I, uh, Alan Rossbridge was the key person in a way because he said it shall be done and he's at the top of the organisation. <laughs> and if you don't have somebody at the top of the organisation saying we need to do this, it's, it doesn't matter how, uh, and you, you never get it done. Um, and I was only key in that I could speak journalism and I could speak a little bit of technology. Uh, but really it's, um, I guess it's the idea that something is an, under existential threat 
which journalism is and was. Or, I mean, journalism isn't, but new, legacy news organisations are under existential threat. So, the, uh, I mean, to us it seemed pretty clear that uh, in about 2001, 2002, that there was no alternative. Um, we had some really smart technologists, really brilliant thinkers, uh, probably who could walk through the newsroom at The Guardian at the time completely unrecognised, who were fundamental to that change. Uh, and it, it really sort of rode on the back of the idea that in order to be successful or to at least have a chance of success on, uh, in, in the digital age, you had to understand and behave more like the web uh, than like a piece of paper, uh, which I know sounds facile, but it's actually there's a whole lot of complicated things that happen once, once you decide that. Um, uh, and so there's a sort of a, an institutional challenge um, in, in, in getting that through. And it's quite painful. It's a very painful process. I'm a print journalist by background. It's a very painful process to have to kind of push through. Uh, but I think that if we hadn't made some of the key decisions we made, even about just, you know, basic how you structure the content and make your databases open and interoperable mm -hmm. and how quickly your website works, it would have been really difficult to you know, expand reach and do kind of international and uh, in, international publishing. And journalism itself, as I say, you know, is not under existential threat. It's incredibly vital, uh, and I mean that in the sort of the alive way. Uh, I think the institutions that have traditionally supported it are under much greater threat. Uh, and, and that's a problem as well, because actually journalists do need to be, you know, there's a role there for, for, for all manner of uh, changes in the ecosystem, but but ultimately, uh, you know, the, the free market can only kind of provide so much of that. Thank you, Katarina. Yes, hi, I'm Katarina Pistor. I'm a member of the Committee on Global Thought, and I'm at the law school. And I very much um, appreciate your your comments. I'm, I teach corporate law, and so I wanted to come back to um, the triangular relationship between the state, the corporate or private sector, and the citizen. Um, because, you know, we have had many experiments in, for example, trying to hold international corporations subject to human rights standards. Mm -hmm. That is not an entirely successful endeavor, <laughs> to, to, to pose yeah. it mildly. And if it succeeds, it typically succeeds if we have some state casting a shadow over the private sector by offering its courts, for example, as a venue where you can dispute or enforce. So the dilemma that we're facing here is that we have a collusive relationship between the private sector and the state, and so the mechanisms by which we citizens can try to hold anybody accountable are hugely problematic. Mm -hmm. So I'd like you to comment a little bit more on that because just invoking conventions that have been rarely enforced, quite frankly, um, is, 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 is probably not, not quite good enough. Um, the other question I just want to raise about is, is thinking about where journalism is going and whether journalism could actually compete with the big digital companies. So The Guardian is doing great because it gets a lot of, lot of hits. But can we imagine a world um, where you know, they, were, they had been earlier than other companies and had used the digital age to really expand and become advocates of basic norms of transparency and accountability in a world so that they embrace the digital age full-heartedly and become competitors. Now, we see newspapers, of course, go down everywhere, right? So they're, they're struggling to survive, and I'm just wondering, is there a business model out there that is not necessarily publicly funded, as our university president suggests, right, but could even be a private model that upholds different types of standards? Can I, can I hold off on answers? Because we have to clear this room very soon and take your question that you have been waiting, and then maybe we do a final round. Yes, hello. Um, I'd like to ask about the, um, given the, the issue of surveillance and you know, putting big data aside for the moment, uh, given the fact that we're talking about not only global surveillance, but surveillance of all electronic media, uh, including all telephone calls, uh, all internet transmissions, everything that can be uh, uh, picked up by a satellite, etc., of every person, partially on the globe and certainly in the United States, what is the um, of journalism, and not just one or two, like The Guardian is certainly to be commended for its incredible work in this area, but to see that the Constitution, including and especially the Fourth Amendment, about um, 
prohibiting uh, unlawful search and seizure is really instituted. And to mention it once, but then never bring it up again, allows things to just go by the board and things to continue. But isn't it the journalist's responsibility to bring it up and keep referring to it and not let it just be ignored? Thank you. All right, Rebecca, you want to start and then? Sure, um, I, I guess I'll sort of combine my answer to your question with, with your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is, yeah, it's, it's highly problematic because in, say, like international labor standards or, or dealing with a lot of other business and human rights issue, the states actually play a positive role in enforcing human rights norms on the companies who are violating them. And that the states actually have laws, you know, or kind of work, you can work with states to enact laws that, that actually help to reinforce the international human rights norms. But with surveillance, we have a problem with the states are violating international human rights norms. Uh, and, and the companies are, to some extent, you know, just collecting a lot of stuff anyway that's, you know, then convenient for the states to, to take and, and also being compelled to uh, cooperate with the state. Um, and so it is problematic. Um, we don't, I, I think, sort of the, the structure of international laws that is ex exists today is not equipped to deal with it. Um, a lot of the efforts to deal with this problem are extra legal at the moment or, or kind of several fronts. You know, one is just an effort, there's actually a website, necessaryandproportionate.org, which is an effort to get at least democratic states to amend their laws to be more in conformity with international human rights norms as a start. Um, there's the Global Network Initiative, which is you know, not a legal effort, but, but rather you know, one of these multi-stakeholder initiatives that tries to get companies to voluntarily commit to principles and be held accountable, you know, th those, those have sort of mixed results. There are efforts, of course, you know, through rankings and trying to get investors to, you know, trying to get consumers to, to vote with their dollars and so on. It's, it's a long battle and even in the best of circumstances, yeah, you know, we, if you look at the labor movement or if you look at some other things, you know, over time we have moved the dial, but, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, but to speak to Saskia's point, which I think also kind of speaks to, to or your question, in my book I write, I, I kind of frame this moment we're in right now in history as we're at a new Magna Carta moment in that, mm -hmm. you know, obviously if one gets nitpicky about history, there's all kinds of ways <laughs> sure, in sure. which it doesn't work. But <laughs> if, if one is just kind of general, um, you know, there was a point 800 years ago where there was only one kind of governance that anybody could imagine, and that was the divine right of kings. And nobody can imagine any <laughs> other way of organizing <laughs> power uh, and any other way of organizing governance. And then some folks kind of said, wait a minute, this ain't working for us so well. It took a long time to move from that to actually kind of coming, you know, society, uh, you know, the, in terms of political thought, consent of the governed, to actually trying to implement the consent of the governed as a system. We now sort of have consent of the governed based on nation state as kind of our ideal form of governance. You know, again, we can get all nitpicky about consent, blah, blah, you know, we won't go there now. But we're sort of at this point where we're recognizing that kind of the nation state organized, even sort of the ideal kind of based on consent of the governed, just does, isn't working for us. If, if the purpose of dealing with, with these problems you know, we need to find a way to constrain power and to hold power accountable yeah. uh, across global digital networks. Existing frameworks just That's aren't right. doing it for us. Yeah. Something needs to be reimagined, which perhaps is where, you know, we need more interdisciplinary thinking and more multidimensional yeah. thinking right. if we're going to get there. But we it's, it's going to take The committee on global one. thought are struggling with it. We're yeah. very interdisciplinary. That is, Mark, what I really liked what you were describing, you know, this working space. But yeah, now I feel very bad because there are, are you all, is there a question there or not? Yes. Yes, well then ask, and that's the end because then we have to leave and then 
Uh, maybe Emily and Mark, hopefully, are the ones that... Uh, hi, my name is uh, Diana. I work for an organization based here in New York called, actually, The Guardian Project, and we develop anti-surveillance mm -hmm. um, yes. open source work. applications. Yeah. So uh, on the need to protect sources, actually, I was very interested because I've been in the last couple of months talking to tons of journalists that work in all over the world. And uh, so, like, in, yeah, asking them about the tools that they use to communicate with their sources. And surprisingly, most of them uh, were still using Facebook, WhatsApp, Viber, even though uh, we have the application, not only ours, but there's a lot out there that help them to do that, to protect their sources. So I was wondering, why do you think they're not acquiring this technology? Why, yeah, there's, uh, there seems to be such a resistance. Or maybe I'm wrong. No, I think you're right. Um, I, the answer is um, sort of complicated because, uh, well, there are two things. First of all, you know, if as a journalist you're going to have impact, you have to reach a broad audience, and therefore you have to be where the audience is consuming news, and you have to be visible. You have to be visible to your sources. I mean, it's an interesting if you read the kind of the relationship between uh, Glenn Greenwald and uh, Edward Snowden. I mean, two things about that. First of all, that Glenn publishes prolifically on national security issues. He blogs all the time. He's always on social media. He engages very kind of, uh, he's very visible to sources. But the moment that Edward Snowden wanted to speak to him, he sent him an encrypted message. And you know, as Glenn said, yeah. didn't really know what to do with it initially. Yeah. Um, so, so I think two things, one of which is just, um, there's, you know, journalists are busy people and uh, that they're not, many of them have not grown up with their feet in the world of having to keep or, or, or thinking that your phone is going to be tapped or your emails are going to be read. And this is, you know, this has to be a shot of adrenaline to the heart, I think, of the journalistic establishment about how, how that has to change. I mean, what was fascinating about being in Boston this morning was I actually had a, a, a barrister come up to me afterwards and said, oh my God, this is like incredibly important for law as well, because we have so many confidential conversations between ourselves and our clients, you know, about sort of their evidence and compiling their cases. And this is a huge for us if these can now be, you know, if these can be interrogated uh, post hoc by the prosecute by the prosecution or by the authorities. This is this is really very serious for us. And we've never thought about it. So I think that, that, that it's just that, you know, there's been an awful lot going on. I think that in America, and I don't want to criticize American journalism because it's great in many ways, it's very thorough, uh, it's done some wonderful work, but it's been asleep, you know, it has been asleep <laughs> for a decade uh, and in shock. Uh, and I think that it's not competitive um, in, in, in the way that it needs to be uh, around some of these issues. Uh, and there are vast resources still in American journalism. Um, that uh, perhaps are not pointing in quite the right direction uh, or, or thinking hard enough about these, these issues. Uh, so I'm glad the Guardian's here to give them a shot. Yeah. Um, all right, I break down one more quick question and maybe Mark, you get to. <laughs> I'm, yes? Okay, thank you. My question Short, is, yes, short. Okay, uh, my question is for anyone who's interested. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm also from China, a visiting scholar here at SIPA. Uh, a country, the China is a country which um, enjoys the great reputation and tradition of uh, uh, civ civilians and control over the society and its own, and its own people, right? Um, so this reminds me of the, uh, the book uh, 1984 from George Orwell and another book by Aldous um, Huxley, the, the Brave New World, right? So um, I have a hypothesis uh, just like the comments uh, from the from Neil's postman, who contracted the book, the two books with the, in his '95 book, he wrote that um, what George Orwell feared, uh, those who deprive us of information. Huxley feared that those who would give us uh, so much that we could, that we, uh, that so much that we would be reduced from the from the passivity and the egotism. Orwell feared that truth will be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth will be drawn in a sea of irrelevance. So I think that's something related to our uh, theme today, that it seems that the old style, uh, old fashion of the control of the civilians now evolving to a new one that uh, do, does not only control uh, the, some entities is, is seeking to control the world, 
Now, not only with his tangible hands, but uh, with the spirit and desire from the people within itself. So I'd like to hear your, your opinion. Thank you very much. You have something to say, Mark, or would you? I can also give a final closing statement. What you said uh, makes me think about a kind of, when I think about what is, what is this complex something that we've got to deal with, you know, from whatever the three perspectives that we have heard here, especially probably Rebecca and Emily, and also in terms of my own work, I think that we are dealing with something that is not just a set of governments, not just a set of people, not just a set of powerful firms. We're really dealing with an assemblage of elements that includes complex technical conditions, that includes, yes, very powerful actors, but it is really a different type of, I don't want to say enemy, but let's say problem or contestant or something that we have to deal with, and it's not going to be simple. I really, I, I think these are very mixed worlds which have the capacity to deploy across a vast set of sort of spaces and domains, and they're a bit intractable. We are used, when you said about something about, oh, the nation state, right? I totally agree with that. You know, we, we are really dealing with multiple spaces in a way, and they're made of technical forms of power, finance hangs in there, governments hang in there, and they are, and a given nation state can have met several of them that are partial. So I just want to leave you with that, with that kind of thought because we now have to end this wonderful session. But I don't want to use the language of the enemy, but just let's downgrade it to the problem or the challenge. It is a mixed world out there that we are dealing with, or a, mi a set of very mixed actors. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you to the speakers.